So hi, Ina. <laughs> Hello, Ma'am Pia. Today, we're starting off our series on talking about psychology, how to relate psychology to our personal lives, and why should we study it and learn to apply it in our daily lives anyway. So I guess we can begin with uh, discussing the broader topic of why should we study psychology? Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, I don't know about the word should. There's, I, I don't believe in the word should. Uh, I'm I so, just like, why would we want to study mm-hmm. psychology? Why would we want? I, I'm hoping everybody's in the room taking up psychology because they want to, not because mm-hmm. they should. Honestly, I don't think anybody mm-hmm. takes psychology because they should. It's not that kind of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like what is it about psychology that makes it extremely helpful and relevant and good in a person's life to know these theories? Um, you know, you know, I, I'm sorry to throw this question back at you yeah. immediately, but I mm-hmm. have an answer. You, uh, I mm-hmm. mean, you're a psychology student. You just graduated. Yes, I how just graduated. Psychology, how has psychology been helpful to you so far? Well... Um, I think I took it at a time in my life when I was going through a, a tough emotional experience. And I think just the insight into understanding how the brain works or how we learn to cope with things, how we understand things and process things gave me a lot of comfort and, um, and equipped me, I guess, with the awareness to become aware of my own uh, thought patterns, behavioral patterns, and kind of also get get a sense of how to improve um, my own reactions to things and how I think through and think through things and behave. So would you say it's the same for you, ma'am? Like why you started developing an interest in psychology? I entered psychology really without any intention of becoming a psychologist. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just like you, the moment I started studying it, or when, especially when I started uh, really going into the, the subjects, particularly dev psych and um, personality psych. It was interesting to see and to really understand how people worked, like what, what led to certain behaviors or why certain behaviors are done by certain people at a certain age. Um, um, all of that was really quite interesting. Um, and I guess it was also how my professors back then taught it, uh, because they always asked us to see how it was true for us in our own lives. So again, like the camera was directed at me, the student, mm-hmm. like I was just directing it at you. Um, so I think studying psychology is relevant because it makes you think about yourself. Mm-hmm. It makes, and, and by doing that, it helps you understand yourself. And when you understand yourself, um, and for example, if you're able to break down your behaviors into um, the why is of it, the how's of it, the where is this rooted mm-hmm. of it, and um, even down to the what are its effects, right? And if this leads to that effect, do I want that effect? Therefore, should I do this action? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that makes it a little more obvious as to how valuable it could be, not just to people who want to be psychologists, but to people who want to be anything, because mm-hmm. the whys and hows of action and the consequences of action um, are just things that are good to know, good to think mm-hmm. about. And that's what makes it very valuable. So it helps you first and foremost to understand yourself. And then next, of course, is it helps you understand other people because these theories are not just applicable to you personally. Otherwise, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be psycho- psychological theories. Mm-hmm. They'd just be personal <laughs> theories. Um, they help us understand other people. And so it helps, you know, with relationships. It helps with, you know, understanding your parents. Mm-hmm. It helps with understanding um, your, your friends. 
Uh, so I think it's relevant for everybody. Mm -hmm. And in the long run, um, yeah, it, because all of our endeavors in life do involve other people, then it's very relevant across everything, any discipline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um as long as you know you, you talk to people or have relationships mm -hmm. it's relevant very well said especially since our the uh social relationships are the cornerstone of our life and how we branch out into different uh career paths mm -hmm. or explore new fields of interest are also uh anchored in our relationships with people and being able to relate to other people well mm -hmm. yeah so thank you, ma'am, for that answer. And um, let's talk about, for example, when you did start uh, venturing into psychology, um, what specializations in psychology have interested you and why? Okay, this, this question actually, um, I'm glad this gets to be asked. When I was taking up psych, I didn't really know like what the psych career would be like um, because one back then it was new it was very new in the Philippines I think when I was in college um, this the law hadn't been passed there were no boards um, um, people didn't go to therapy mm -hmm. uh, a lot yet back then um, but in general people think okay psychologists are therapists okay that's one field Okay, of specialization. You can become a counseling psychologist. That's actually something that I do. So I do therapy. And the counseling psychologist is someone who, uh, in the Philippines, you take a psych, or actually, even if it's a non psych undergrad, mm -hmm. um, you take an MA in mm -hmm. psychology, and then you take the boards, and then you get trained and get supervised. Mm -hmm. to become a counseling psychologist. That's the usual idea that people have yes, when you say yes. psychologist, right? So mm -hmm. that's what we mean when we say, we, I practice, I, am, I do therapy, I'm, I'm a counseling or a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, right. And even here in the Philippines, when you say clinical psychologist, um, technically what it means is you take you talk a PhD in mm -hmm. clinical psych, mm -hmm. but not all of us who take on clinical cases our clinical PhD. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, I do not have a PhD in clinical mm -hmm. psych, but I do take on clinical cases. Mm -hmm. What would so, you mean by clinical cases, ma'am? Um, I have clients who have um, formal diagnoses mm -hmm. um, or heavy cases like trauma, uh, um, like heavy cases of depression, major depression, mm -hmm. um, no, uh, diagnosis of like, anxiety. So mm -hmm. actually I work very closely with um, psychiatrists too, okay, mm -hmm. because many of my clients also need um, mm -hmm. medication. So mm -hmm. I'm the one who does the talk therapy mm -hmm. with them and then they go to mm -hmm. their psychiatrists for their meds. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, so, now that we're here, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists are different. Okay, to become a psychiatrist, you need an MD. Okay, so that you, uh, and uh, usually their view is the medical model. Mm -hmm. So it's more towards psychopharmacology, the prescription of medication, and um, more towards the body and yes. what adjustments the body needs to make. And then mm -hmm. the psychologist, although of course I, I do, still keep track of these things. I ask my clients about their meds, I ask my clients about their, you know, exercise routine and their sleeping mm -hmm. habits and their eating habits, mm -hmm. etc. It still does take part, but but that's not my expertise. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just something I consider. Um, but then not all psychologists are are therapists. Um, some uh, psychologists are in psychology to research. Okay? Mm -hmm. So um, here is where um, social psychologists and de developmental psychologists come, come in. Um, developmental psychologists are people who do research or um, develop interventions for um, with the uh, 
uh, well, developmental theories in consideration. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this means that they look at um, stages mm -hmm. in a person's life mm -hmm. and how people are different at each stage. Mm -hmm. okay? And they design interventions or they research um, particular aspects of, um, you know, for example, adolescence mm -hmm. or uh, late, late life. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, I see. And then social psych is another interesting field where mm -hmm. uh, they look at um, bigger phenomena. Mm -hmm. They look at, for example, the phenomena of peace mm -hmm. or, uh, or um, you know, what gets people to vote or not vote mm -hmm. or um, so bigger social phenomena mm -hmm. is what they, they actually research. Um, there's also personality psych. Mm -hmm. um, personality psych research uh, is research into what are the things that make up a person's personality. Mm -hmm. So like traits, um, uh, what is the Filipino personality made up of? What are the major traits that are found and make up the Filipino personality? Mm -hmm. um, and that's research. Okay? And so me, I'm not a research psych uh, research um, psychologist, mm -hmm. um, but some psychologists are that. Some psychologists mm -hmm. do research and not practice. Some people just practice and don't do research. Some people do both. Um, so there. I've dabbled in a lot of them, but mm -hmm. I found that my love really it belongs to practice. So, yeah. Practice. So, so counseling and uh, clinical psychology. Right. You work with a lot of psychiatrists as well. So a lot of uh, dealing with mental health. You yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So now that we've talked about what there, uh, the different kinds of fields there are in psychology and whom psychology is relevant for, maybe we can talk about now how psychology began to emerge as a field or as a study. So um, what perspectives have shaped its development from the start. I know that um, the ancient Greeks uh, started to hypothesize about uh, where does the human psyche come from or what makes us us. And gradually, it, uh, I, I believe it started with uh, structuralism. So could you tell us about what, structural, what structuralism is and how it's relevant to us right now? How, can we, how do we see it in our everyday lives right now? Okay. <laughs> All right. So those two things, structuralism and functionalism. I like your question. Like, how is it relevant? Why do I care? <laughs> um, but if you look at, if you, if you try just now, if you are trying to understand a person's mind and how a person thinks, it's still a good thing to go back to structuralism and functionalism. Mm -hmm. The structuralism is about what is there what are the components of a mind mm -hmm. so when you ask that question you're like huh what do you mean the components of a mind mm -hmm. right so just now i want you to kind of close your eyes and, and try to answer that question what are the components of my mind mm -hmm. okay so when you look at your mind and you imagine your mind what's there so you can open your eyes. Like, what I do you would notice? Say thoughts or okay. words. All right. So you're when you look at chatter. something. When you look at something and then it makes you think, oh, this is blue, or okay. this is a, a vase. And okay. so your thoughts mm -hmm. and um, the parts of your thoughts that are uh, composed of sensory inputs, like your visuals. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, maybe even sounds, but the, all of those are components of thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thought, sensorial, um, material. What else is that? All that's inside. Um, I there are emotions. Would you okay. say emotion is yeah. a is a component? So yeah, so your mm -hmm. emotional world. Feeling happy or sad sometimes. Or every time I throw the question at you and you're not ready, you feel a little. Ah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, a little nervous. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. So, so there's that. Those are the structures of your mind. 
those are the structures that your inner world. And that's what the, the movement of structuralism tried to do. They tried to look inside and they tried to see um, by observing what can we, uh, what form can we see and observe when we look inside in this way. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, even just that um, in more uh, current um, movements in psychology, like mindfulness, um, if you're familiar or if you know, anybody mm -hmm. in the class is familiar, um, there are very strong functional uh, structural components in the meditations that you do. You're, you're, you mm -hmm. meditate and to notice your thoughts. You meditate to notice your emotions. Mm -hmm. you, you meditate on uh, what you see and what you hear and what you taste and what you smell and what you sense uh, around you. All of these things were very much like what they were trying to label and what they were trying to describe mm -hmm. when the structuralists started with this whole um, way of thinking about people. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, this is... This was a way of observing and acknowledging something that couldn't be readily observed uh, just by looking at a person, because this is the inner world. So that's the value of structure. Mm -hmm. So it's you would say like the the cultivating the self awareness first, and then yes. being able to reflect on the contents of the mind and how they how we. So how did the functionalism place into it in um, the functionalists the man mm -hmm. um, so the structuralists wanted to label wanted mm -hmm. to see the, the forms mm -hmm. right um, the functionalists what they wanted to do was to say um, you can't really measure anything uh, you, uh, because all you have is um, observation and all we get oh the only person who can observe what's happening inside of you is you so mm -hmm. there's nothing very objective about that mm -hmm. so, so the function is actually said check that out and w what's more important is that we find how it works mm -hmm. how we adapt how we use our minds uh, to adapt to everyday life to our functions mm -hmm. to um, what we need to do work play study etc that's what's important so functionalism is about how our brains our minds our internal world adapts to our external world mm -hmm. so think about how you um, learn okay how you problem solve how you are able to think about how to cook an egg versus how you are able to think about and do, if you know how, uh, ride a bike. Mm -hmm. okay? Those are two different functions, but somehow our minds know how to do it. Those are actually two mechanical functions. Mm -hmm. But then suppose you learn how to read a story, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and by reading, you're able to give yourself certain experiences of wonder of uh, um, dreams and by dreams I mean like goals mm -hmm. so that is a function of the mind what is that for how does that help you survive adapt mm -hmm. become uh, uh, a person in this world mm -hmm. and that's that's those are the kinds of questions that the functionalists were more interested in mm -hmm. so they're very different they're very different but um, you can see how those two uh, ideas, um, schools of uh, thought mm -hmm. uh, were foundational to what we now know mm -hmm. as psychology. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just those two questions, yeah. right? Those are uh, like how to ride a bike, how to cook an egg. There's so many ways to cook yeah. eggs. Yes, uh, yes. And how to dream, how <laughs> to have goals for yourself. Mm -hmm. Those are all different functions of the mind. What are they for? How do they help us live? How do they help us adapt in society? Mm -hmm. Those are very functional uh, kind of questions. So from learning the contents of what the mind was and um, learning how to apply it 
and use it in the different aspects of our lives. Um, it kind of also moved towards this, uh, this, this Gestaltian movement or the Gestalt movement of how experiences or the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So greater than the, um, the contents that we were labeling a while mm -hmm. ago or mm -hmm. fitting into certain categories of our lives. So can you tell us more about what does that actually mean? Like the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Okay, all right. So the exercise, I usually have an exercise here that I, I do in class, but since now, uh, well, okay, for those who are watching this in video, um, okay, for, the, for those who are listening, maybe you just try an, an image, any image, okay, anything. Oh my God, you can be looking at your phone. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to look at my phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. You, uh, what are you looking I'll, at? I'll do that with you. Okay. I'll, so I'll also you're going to look at your phone. Mm -hmm. So when you look at your phone, okay, you can um, feel it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. It has edges. Mm -hmm. It has flat surfaces. Mm -hmm. It has a function. Mm -hmm. Right. You use it on mm -hmm. text, the text, the and communicate with people like okay. on social media. All right. Those are its different parts. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when you lose a phone, have you ever lost a phone? Mm -hmm. Yes. Have and you ever broken a phone? Been... Yes. Okay. Or, mm -hmm. When that happens, what? How do you feel? It it almost feels like you're losing a limb because right. it's not just the phone that you're losing, but I guess the mm -hmm. being able to connect with other people and being able to entertain yourself when it's needed. Right. So, and sometimes it's the phone itself. Mm -hmm. Like this object is something that you have attached some mm -hmm. kind of value to. That is not just. I mean, all right, fine. Phones are expensive, mm -hmm. but sometimes it hurts more than that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's not the cost of it, which is a, uh, one of the aspects of it. A part of it is the cost. A part of it is the surfaces of it. A part of it is the functions of it. A part of it is what it contains, memories. Uh, a part of it is what you use it for. But putting all of that together, that is your experience of your phone. That is, so the gestalt of a phone is why you have that feeling. The feeling of attachment or... Of yeah, you don't attach to the, just the surfaces and the lines mm -hmm. and the functions. Mm -hmm. You attach to it as a whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why, like, when, when I lose a phone, it's almost like you, you lost, like, mm -hmm. like, like, you know everything's in the cloud, mm -hmm. for example. Yes. You know, everything's in the cloud and you're gonna, you can recover all of it back. But it still hurts. Yeah, it feels like you've been through a lot with that phone. Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. right. So that experience is actually something um, that portrays the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Okay. Right. Yeah. Or like people. Okay. Mm -hmm. For example, you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you can write a list about all the things that I know about Ina. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <not> that. <laughs> and we have to write a list about all the things she knows about me okay mm -hmm. um, but the, that list the parts okay even if it includes descriptions of for example Pia has mm -hmm. green hair sometimes mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. green she likes mm -hmm. makeup mm -hmm. um, she's a psychologist even if I list all of those things, mm -hmm. the Pia, that is the whole, mm -hmm. is the whole, the just thought, the experience mm -hmm. of that, is more than just the list, any list that could be mm -hmm. made of me. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for you. So that's, 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 the, that's, uh, that's the just thought movement. Of course, the way it was studied before was mm -hmm. very, um, was a, just a lot more technical than my explanation mm -hmm. for it. So they actually uh, went to, and the research that they, they would do were very sensorial. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, um, 
uh, when you look at an image, okay, uh, if you break an image up into, um, uh, you know, those uh, visual, what do you call that? Um, like optical illusions. Optical illusions. Yes. <laughs> those yeah. optical illusions where um, um, it's like your mind fills in the blanks, mm -hmm. okay? It's just a bunch of lines, but you can see that it's a figure, but mm -hmm. actually it's just a bunch of lines. But because of our mind's um, propensity to just stop, mm -hmm. okay? um, fill in the blanks, basically. Fills in the blanks. Mm -hmm. You see the greater whole, not mm -hmm. just the parts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right. so yeah, it was um, they studied lines and mm -hmm. um, uh, s sensory. Uh, sensory factors. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All right. So that is the gestalt perspective. And now I guess uh, moving on to a very prominent figure in psychology, who, uh, uh, Sigmund Freud, who coined the term psychoanalysis. So uh -huh. how, who was Freud and why was he so popular anyway? Why does everyone think of Freud when we Think about psychology right well because he was a very interesting man <laughs> and his ideas are very interesting mm -hmm. um, although of course I won't I won't take away from the fact that his ideas are very important mm -hmm. it's just that their the ideas were also quite shocking uh, and time. very yes. easily very easily sensationalized mm -hmm. even until now yeah that's <laughs> it's true it's that's why he's remembered until now Freud. Yeah. Right? So, what comes to mind when I say Sigmund Freud? Uh, me. Yeah. S sex, probably. Right. That's, that's what everyone thinks when they hear about right. Freud. Yes. Right. So, because because so. it's quite central in his theory. Okay. Um, uh, he actually called the stages uh, of development. Um, psychosexual stages mm -hmm. and he talked a lot about how sex and aggression are basic drives of mm -hmm. um, human behavior mm -hmm. um, and of course he's I don't know every time I discuss the Oedipus complex everyone's like yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's weird um, mm -hmm. but but uh, Freud was a person who really even though he was not really the first okay he, he was the one who really popularized and put together a lot of different ideas into what one might um, understand as a rather global uh, under, um, well, because many of the theorists that followed him later mm -hmm. on expanded on his mm -hmm. ideas. Mm -hmm. um, he, his theory was a good um, springboard. springboard. Okay? So um, he was most importantly uh, credited, mm -hmm. or, or maybe what he was one of his most important uh, uh, contributions was his um, turning of attention to what what he called the uh, the unconscious. unconscious. Okay. Mm -hmm. So not everything that we are we are aware of mm -hmm. and this part that we are not aware of is called the unconscious and even if we are not aware of this many many things in our unconscious influence our behavior mm -hmm. and um so yeah there and he mm -hmm. said like many urges like um the urge urges regarding sex and mm -hmm. um, aggression. Mm -hmm. Of course, we also kind of, um, uh, we notice that he was born at a time when, you know, people were very repressed mm -hmm. and there were a lot of, you know, societal uh, uh, structures mm -hmm. that of made things. people very yes. repressed. That's yes. why, probably why, uh, a lot of things were pushed into the unconscious. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a very, that's a modern way of understanding now, Freud. Um, 
consider even considering that i actually always ask the question you know when you turn on your tv or, or sorry nobody watches tv anymore you, you turn on netflix netflix and youtube okay or no. youtube okay what are you likely to watch like a show yes what show what shows are there uh What's there's popular right now there's yeah. nlo homes i believe and there's emily in paris and uh, when i see what's popular and that okay so all right so yeah. enola holmes mm -hmm. i haven't seen it but uh, yeah what's it about it's about i think she's the sister of sherlock holmes so it's played by millie bobby brown and right. henry cavill's and, in there and yeah. is it also like a murder mystery kind of i think thing? so although i've only seen uh, right. the trailer yeah right. i'm assuming because it's like a homes mm -hmm. yeah thing. so they're trying their to kind of thing to solve something right so it's about what it's about, it's a, um, it's about the sister of sherlock holmes yeah I but think. what's she doing yeah. so i really i think she's also so solving mysteries although i could i really i'm not sure and the so, mysteries usually involve um i guess does it involve picnics yeah. and uh, um, like dinner? Mm -hmm. What do <laughs> mysteries involve? They usually involve? Uh, mysteries usually involve crimes. Crimes. They usually involve right. uh, murders maybe or murders, uh, theft. Crimes. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. And that's what, those are what kind of behaviors if we look at Freud. Those, murders, mm -hmm. theft. So would, would, Freud think that they are wrong or would why are we watching this why are we why do we enjoy watching about murders and theft maybe because there are human um uh, instincts maybe or it or we all fall victim to thoughts about that sometimes right. for example when someone pisses us off yeah. and you you think about uh yeah, but but not. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so there's something in us that is attracted to these things, mm -hmm. right? Why why do you watch action movies? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, and you were just like the you fantasy some of horror thing yeah. last night. Yeah, yeah. I watched um, Unsolved Mysteries last night, and there was something about right. ghosts. And yeah. mm -hmm. I guess right. just the. Um, I watched it because I was just curious. Uh, th the episode was about a tsunami that happened uh, a few years ago. And I think I watched it because there was also a part of me that was so curious about the impacts of uh, natural disaster and right. how we are all prone right. to that sometimes. I mean, right. we're all vulnerable so to that. So if you look at just those the last five minutes, we've been talking about how we people watch things that are about destruction, mm -hmm. that are about aggression, mm -hmm. that are about things that harm other people. And we do that because we want to. So that's a behavior mm -hmm. that is driven by something, curiosity, um, wondering or even just pure wanting to be entertained mm -hmm. but it is towards something rather aggressive mm -hmm. right and it's, freud would say well that is the basic drive for mm -hmm. um that the aggressive drive mm -hmm. okay? we, it doesn't mean we're all aggressive but it means we're all aggressive somewhere down there mm -hmm. right? And then right. the other, the other, the other movie that's popular is Emily in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, what about that? Okay, fine. That's not the aggressive drive. Mm -hmm. What what drive is that? It's, it's a movie about what? About probably love and exploring, uh, mm -hmm. love for another place, exploring mm -hmm. yourself. So, is that another drive that Freud? um hypothesized about uh, is it well it's about beauty, beauty. and um yes. you know, pleasure mm -hmm. even a pleasure in new objects and new mm -hmm. places um i'm i don't know does it have like a love story mm -hmm. in it i have no mm -hmm. idea yeah. is it 
Uh, I actually, I also really don't know. I also watched a, a bit of the trailer, but it, uh, okay. my, my friends did say it's a feel good kind of um, okay. romantic light okay. vibe. There. So, so yeah. anything with, you put the word romantic on it, it's mm-hmm. like, okay, right. So, mm-hmm. right. And yeah, almost any movie actually that you watch or anything that's popular has some kind of romantic. Mm-hmm angle or it's just filled with attractive people mm-hmm. and why are we attracted to these people it's because they're attractive <laughs> and and really that's that's what the other drive is that's what mm-hmm. the sex drive is it's mm-hmm. that attraction to um to sex mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and whatever, beautiful things and pleasure, yeah. et cetera. Yes. And that's, that's also something that Freud talked about. Mm-hmm. So, so if you, any media or, you know, just, you know, look out the window, you look, before I would say, look at billboards, uh, look at commercials, uh, look at how things are sold, mm-hmm. um, you know, what are the movies or, or the series that are popular? Always, it's about one way or another. It's about yeah. aggression or mm-hmm. it's about sex. Yes. So, and yes. that, and I say that is why we study Freud until now, because mm-hmm. in some way, what he said is still true. Mm-hmm. We still see it in the world until now. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't consciously watch this. I'm going to watch this because it's about sex, mm-hmm. <laughs> or I'm going to watch this because it's about it satisfies my aggressive urges no because those are things that are in our unconscious Mm -hmm. so even though we don't we're not conscious of it we're just drawn to these things and people who make movies like know exactly that people are naturally drawn to these things so yeah yeah probably Mm -hmm. because of Freud. (laughs) yeah or or because we just know it naturally Mm -hmm. we know it even without this theory um we know it we can feel it. Um, so Freud actually just kind of brought to light or made conscious mm-hmm. something that is very unconscious in there mm-hmm. in all of us. Mm-hmm. So, so there. Um, mm-hmm. um, that's probably his most important contribution. Mm-hmm. We'll talk more about Freud uh, yeah. later on in yeah. more detail. But for now, let's... Uh, Sprinkle a little bit of uh, How come? sensationalism yes. there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, from Freud and psychoanalysis, how did it suddenly move to this movement called behaviorism, which almost seemed to reject everything that Freud said about the unconscious mind and uh, focus on behavior alone? So, um, can we actually really study the behavior in isolation? And is that still okay. relevant until now? Well, behaviorism really actually was really, uh, it was almost like a rejection of Freud. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, mm-hmm. Freud's ideas were quite weird and, and um, uh, they're very hard to study. Because mm-hmm. um, yeah, how do you do that? How do you dissect uh, a human mind and mm-hmm. say, this part is unconscious and it's mm-hmm. filled with sex and death? Um, it's hard to do that, and it's hard to do that with and without any kind of manipulation. And we find that Freud's uh, methods weren't exactly very great either. Yeah. Um, so the behaviorists came in because they uh, thought, oh, that's too hard. Okay, mm-hmm. you cannot really reliably scientifically study in that way. So let's put this idea of the mind out of research because it's useless because we can't study it. Mm-hmm. And now all we can study is whatever we can measure its um, behavior, whatever, only what we can observe and whatever we, uh, whatever it is that we can measure, that's what we're gonna um, study. So that's basically um, it. So that's the advantage. The advantage is that what, what, how you see people is um, very limited and therefore very uh, 
easier to study. Mm -hmm. uh, easier because you can measure it, mm -hmm. because it's very finite, mm -hmm. and it's because it's um, observable. Mm -hmm. okay. So there's a way of uh, wanting to control behavior and modify our own behaviors. It's that aspect of behaviorism, isn't there? Like, okay, yes. So behaviorists, um, when we talk about behaviorism, and again, we'll talk about this more later on, um, the ideas of conditioning okay, and uh, uh, behavior modification okay, will come in. Um, but basically what this is, it looks at behavior and then before behavior, what causes behavior mm -hmm. and the consequences of behavior. Mm -hmm. And if you change one or the other, it looks at behavior like a formula, mm -hmm. like a math equation. Mm -hmm. If you change one thing, uh, the cause, then you can change the behavior. Mm -hmm. and Or if you change the consequence, you can change something else. So if you mm -hmm. like, change a variable, you can change something else. And that allows for more control of mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so um, by paring it down into something very basic, some, uh, it, it allows for the idea mm -hmm. of more control mm -hmm. uh, in, in people's lives. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so on the one hand, Freud in psychoanalysis was very floaty and weird mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. almost like uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the behaviorists, behaviorist idea was very um, controlled mm -hmm. and very dry, mm -hmm. um, but also at the same time, um, human beings not aren't quite mm -hmm. that uh, clear cut, mm -hmm. exactly. and um, and so that kind of inspired the next movement. So if the behaviorism was kind of a response to psychoanalysis, there was this new uh, movement called humanism, which was a response to behaviorism. So uh, why was it called humanism anyway? Well, the first two uh, movements, psychoanalysis and behaviorists, um, they were thought to be rather uh, deterministic. Okay? So for Kasper um, Freud, um, our past, basically, or our, our unconscious, our, it, that's what creates our behavior. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's really hard to control. So we are made from these basic drives that we are born with. And then for behaviorists, it's we are controlled by these, the stimuli in our environment. Mm -hmm. um, so the humanist said, mm, I don't think that's quite our experience as human beings. Mm -hmm. We do have some measure of control and choice in our lives. And that's why it's called humanistic perspective mm -hmm. because um, it focuses on, on that, our, our freedoms, mm -hmm. our, our, our choices, mm -hmm. our, our free will, uh, um, our, the, the fullest potential of becoming mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. human person so mm -hmm. it's about that it's it's a lot more optimistic mm -hmm. um and rather than deterministic mm -hmm. that's why it was very different mm -hmm. all right so from a humanistic perspective there's a, another uh perspective which is the biopsychological perspective which is uh, also quite contrary to humanism maybe it's very reductionist or tries to um, reduce behavior down to its component parts, right? So yeah. how are these concepts still applicable to uh, in our everyday lives, knowing the, that behavior or cognition is reducible to the activity of a neuron, for example? All right. So like biopsych the biopsychological perspective is like the cooler younger brother <laughs> the behaviorist perspective mm -hmm. because the behaviorists could only observe you know behavior actions um but by the when the biopsychologists came in they're like no we can actually look inside your brain mm -hmm. and trace where 
behavior is coming from. It's because it's coming from levels of you know neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. It's coming from um, uh, we can measure your heart rate. We can measure your uh, your breathing. We can measure your skin conductance, how much you're mm -hmm. sweating, so, and that's mm -hmm. how we know if you're anxious or not. Mm -hmm. That's how we know if you're excited or attracted to someone. Mm -hmm. Your eye, eye, if your pupils dilate, etc. Um, so the biopsychological perspective is, um, yeah, it's, it's like that where it looks at human behavior as uh, a function of um, the hardware that we have, and mm -hmm. that's our bodies, mm -hmm. okay? our, that's our biology. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of relevance, well, mm -hmm. we have our bodies, right? Our bodies mm -hmm. are real. Mm -hmm. and that's where we live. We live in our bodies. And I don't know about anybody here who has not lived in their body. Um, but if you, because that is our hardware and that is our everyday experience, mm -hmm. then how can it not be relevant? Mm -hmm. right? So um, I think the biopsychological perspective, uh, again, we're going to mm -hmm. take a whole chapter mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. that's yes, we'll discuss too. it later. Um, it actually allows us, it's not counter mm -hmm. to Freud or the humanists, mm -hmm. okay? uh, but if that's the software, okay, the biopsychological perspective allows us mm -hmm. to look at the hardware. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, for Freud, um, from Freud, we can talk about uh, the creative drive, mm -hmm. the drive to, um, okay, it's called the sex drive, okay? Yeah. Drive to things, <laughs> yeah. things, to make something new, to, 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 to study, to mm -hmm. consume things, to enjoy food, okay? Mm -hmm. um, that's the idea of it. That's the software. Okay? That's the experience of it. But we can only experience that with our hardware. And that's mm -hmm. where the biopsychological concept comes. Uh, concepts come in. Um, our drive to create, okay, um, may be driven by particular parts of our brain. Okay, mm -hmm. like for example, the dopamine reward system. Mm -hmm. Okay, we want to make art or we want to connect with that person mm -hmm. because these things are firing in our brain. Mm -hmm. um, whether one causes the other or not, is, that's uh, mm -hmm. what actually causes behavior. That's a, actually a big and long um, debate. Mm -hmm. Okay, And mm -hmm. we, we're probably not going to go into that until you enter, you take physiological psych later on. Mm -hmm. uh, when you actually go into mm -hmm. like the minute processes of mm -hmm. uh, um, motivation and movement, okay, I'm gonna end up ahead of myself. <laughs> but 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 yeah, like so, there's a part of your brain that fires and makes you feel good whenever you see your crush, mm -hmm. and um, it's there whether you know it or not. But if you're interested in things like that, then the biopsychological perspective would be interesting, mm -hmm. and it's relevant and applicable because. It's there every day, all the time. Mm -hmm. It's it's where you live. So if you know how your how your body works, works. yes, okay. yes. Okay. If you know how your body works, then again, actually, you can get, gain some measure of control. Mm -hmm. Like very practically, for example, if you're nervous, nervous is software. Mm -hmm. Nervous is I am scared of this mm -hmm. or that. I am, I I'm. Um, it's something nervous. It's something that will make me nervous. Um, I guess teaching for the first time or teaching okay. your first class at the start of the semester. All right. right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to meet my students mm -hmm. and I am nervous. Mm -hmm. And nervousness is not just an idea. Mm -hmm. It's not just a feeling. A feeling is not just an idea mm -hmm. that's floating in your psyche. Mm -hmm. A feeling is something you feel in your body. Mm -hmm. nervousness is your heart rate going up nervousness is your breathing becoming short because uh your um sympathetic state has mm -hmm. been triggered okay mm -hmm. so if you know that oh nervousness is the fast beating of my heart 
the sharpness of my breath, the twisting of my stomach. Actually, you can even take a step forward and say, okay, what can I do to calm down my nervousness? Oh, I can calm down the muscles in my neck. Because I, have, I can actually do some practices and exercises that will help my mus neck muscles kind of calm down. I can do slow breathing to help my heart rate go down. And if I do that, I am able to have some measure of control over my body, the software, mm -hmm. so that I can have some measure of control over the um, over my body, the hardware, so that I can have some measure of control over my feelings, the software. So it really highlights that there's a connection between the mind and the body, and by um, becoming more aware of processes, processes in our body, we can mm -hmm. start to uh, help our mind think in, uh, or help calm our nervousness, or help us in yes. certain social relationships, or, yes. yeah. Right. right. So, and you mentioned that the bio, uh, psychological perspective is like the hardware, or getting to know the hardware aspect. Mm -hmm. So, how would you say our evolution plays into that, or how, would the, how human evolution or influences uh, how we think, how we feel, how we behave now. So, okay. So again, the evolutionary perspective is like, is it the younger, cooler brother? <laughs> it's not. I think it's more like um, uh, they're twins. Okay. Because uh, the evolutionary perspective, naman, um, tells us about why. Uh, why we might have developed certain things, um, whether it's uh, organs, okay? Why do we have an amygdala, <laughs> um, the thing inside mm -hmm. our brain that acts as our warning system? Why is our nose, our olfactory system, separate from the rest of our sensory systems? Mm -hmm. You know that? <laughs> like, the sense, the sensory, uh, the olfactory bulbs are not uh, exactly connected to the brain. Like for example, it right, just goes yeah. directly, or it goes, yeah, yeah. The so, sensory pathway to the, the your sense of smell is different. It's its own particular pathway mm -hmm. versus all the other senses mm -hmm. that go to all different parts of the brain. It goes directly to where it's processed. Mm -hmm. uh, it skips a lot of steps. So things like that. Why? Why? Why is our our sense of smell so special in that way? Mm -hmm. Or for example, um, so uh, the evolutionary perspective helps us understand that. Which I don't know. I guess to me that's interesting because it's kind of cool to know things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's because I'm a nerd. But mm -hmm. In the greater scheme of things, also the evolutionary perspective allows us to see why we behave in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, because behavior is adaptive, mm -hmm. and if we evolved in these behaviors over millennia, mm -hmm. why is it adaptive? Why is it here? How does it actually help us survive? Or what makes it not adaptive anymore, and how should we change it to help mm -hmm. us? further survive. Mm -hmm. So if you look at groups of human beings, okay, um, you can think about problematic behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I'll be very direct. I, um, when I do teach Fisha Psych, I talk about depression, for example. Depression is a function of our biology. And it's also a function of our um, societal processes mm -hmm. but it means that if we exhibit it now we somehow evolve as human beings mm -hmm. to have this particular um, phenotype mm -hmm. like expression mm -hmm. of behavior what is it for right? yeah. something so upsetting and something so debilitating what is it for So the evolution runs and actually helps us answer that. Mm -hmm. um, so one short answer is that depression is kind of like an overactive freeze mechanism. Mm -hmm. right? We have our instincts, fight, flight, freeze. Mm -hmm. And depression is a very strong freeze behavior. 
-hmm. But what is the freeze behavior for in the first place? It's to when there's a predator. Protect us, yes. Threat, you, mm -hmm. you by by freezing, it, it stops the predator from thinking that you're a prey. And so it's a protective mechanism yes. also in a way. Yeah. Right, right. So with this understanding of, okay, it's a protective mechanism, it actually really helps me understand mm -hmm. um, my clients, for mm -hmm. example, who have depression. Because, okay, you're, and it's kind of like a weird, kind of awkward way to be kinder to yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, depression is an overactive defense system that your body activates. Mm -hmm. So how do we teach you to actually, hey, it's okay now. How do we teach your body to kind of get out of that by telling your body, hey, it's okay now. You can come out of it. There's no threat. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe one way or another we'll find out what is the threat. We'll find it because it may not be obvious. Maybe the threats millennia ago w would be the, the dinosaur, the saber-toothed tiger yeah. <laughs> and the babuy the ball. Yeah. Okay. Um, but now it's not that. It's the modern world. And I don't know what the babuy the ball and the saber-toothed tigers are in the world right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not quite so obvious. But if we understand these behaviors in that way, they get activated because of some hyperactive threat mode. Mm -hmm. It helps us understand the behavior, period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now, if we find out what the threats are and we deal with them, it will help that threat mode to lessen. Mm -hmm. So we get to that kind of understanding through the evolutionary, the evolutionary perspective. perspective. So you mentioned, for example, depression is aside from having an evolutionary function originally, that is also a product of culture. So how does um, culture, how is a social cultural perspective another important aspect of psychology mm -hmm. nowadays? So how, how does the culture influence a person's psychology? Yeah, okay. So, um especially with what's happening to the world right now, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. okay? So we're in the middle of a pandemic, that's why classes are like this. Um, they're not classes, it's now a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, one phenomena that's really, really very blatantly in our faces right now is the phenomena of not being able to see each other, mm -hmm. okay? Disconnection. Mm -hmm. um, and disconnection is something that um, is almost, um, if we look at human beings okay, and culture and how culture works okay, from a social cultural perspective, like Filipinos, we're very, um, we're very, very uh, collective. Mm -hmm. okay? We yeah, Asian like cultures see, generally. Yeah, right? we like to see our friends. We like to see um, our different family members. Mm -hmm. we're, we're very connected. And all of a sudden now we cannot. Mm -hmm. We cannot. Um, maybe before uh, there were families who used to visit each other mm -hmm. um, every weekend to visit the grandparents. But now you can't do that. Mm -hmm. okay? So in with this because we were that culture and now we are not, it puts us, uh, the people in this culture, under a particular kind of strain. And um, this is why there, this is one theory as to why there is a rise in cases of anxiety mm -hmm. uh, and depression and other mental health issues because we are now, um, uh, struggling and stressed because of a change in our culture mm -hmm. okay? because we're not used to that so that's one theory as to why um, for example there may be uh, growing cases of depression mm -hmm. and anxiety right now yeah. because of that big change um, we are not acting as we usually do and again so that's kind of like uh, if we, you go back to the evolutionary perspective, it's like we're under threat. Mm -hmm. It's like our body knows there's a problem, so it goes into this automatic mm -hmm. defense mode. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, I mean, that's just one thing. We can also go to the fact that, oh, actually, this is not our first, uh, our first foray into disconnection. Mm -hmm. We have been moving towards disconnection mm -hmm. for some time now because mm -hmm. of the rise of technology. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, the older generation will say, oh, the younger people, they're always on their mm -hmm. phones. They're mm -hmm. always like, uh, just they're, they don't talk to each other anymore. They just mm -hmm. chat or not even chat, they just like each other's photos, la la la. So all of these ideas about how culture as a whole, mm -hmm. whether it's the culture of the internet, for example, the culture of a generation, for example, or just the culture of a city or a country, mm -hmm. these things affect our personality, mm -hmm. okay? And can also affect our mental health. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what the social cultural perspective adds to the table. Mm -hmm. um, how our social norms or values or things like this, um, uh, events that affect mm -hmm. the society as a whole, how this affects us as individuals too. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the social, social cultural perspective uh, offers us. Wow. All right. So we've tackled the whys of um, why it's important to value psychology and why psychology has shaped the way it is uh, today. But let's start to go to the question, how do we begin to study psychology? Is psychology a science? Is it an art? So, and if ever it is a science, what makes it a science? Okay. <laughs> this is, I mean, I always find this question rather funny because, mm -hmm. um, some parts of psychology mm -hmm. are almost going towards really the hard sciences, mm -hmm. okay? Where, um, for example, cognitive neuroscience is hardly even psychology, although I refer to it a lot because it's interesting and it, and it uh, informs my understanding of people. It's no longer psychology, but it is kind of rooted in psychology where we look at the brain Okay. We look at the brain and we, we look at parts of the brain and activation of, you know, particular parts of the brain and how that helps us understand uh, clinical syndromes like depression or bipolar disorder mm -hmm. or anxiety or trauma. Okay, so some parts of psychology are informed or are like that already where measurements are really precise, mm -hmm. where it's almost like a hard science. Mm -hmm. okay? But some parts of psychology like where I live, um, it's really, it's not quite um, that easy to make precise measurements. Like for example, how do you really measure happiness? Of course, we can, we can make measures of it. Mm -hmm. We can try to define it, uh, make an operational definition mm -hmm. and um, find this or that. But at the end of the day, it is something that is hard to define and maybe different defined for different people so in that it turns into something that's not quite hard rather more soft mm -hmm. um, as a science mm -hmm. uh, so it goes towards something that's more art mm -hmm. um, in my personal practice for example um, some psychologists and therapists are very structured Okay. They do uh, interventions like CBT, which is one, you know, rather modulized and very structured, but some do not. Okay. My own approach is very eclectic. I pull from, I do pull from CBT. I pull from um, mindfulness uh, approaches. I pull from psychodynamic approaches. I look at developmental perspectives. I look at sociocultural perspectives. I also look at biopsychological <laughs> perspectives. So how I practice is kind of, I know for myself that how I practice psychology is really more towards art. Because mm -hmm. um, and I prefer it that way because I deal with people as individuals and they're complex mm -hmm. and it's magolo and um, and therefore I find that I have to be rather like that too flexible and complex mm -hmm. so that I can meet them in their complexities. So um, there's no one answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Some parts of it uh, look more like the hard sciences. Some parts of it look 
um, more like the middle. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. some parts of it just look like, what is that? <laughs> but 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 still, even if it looks magulo and uh, very flexible and really more like an art. As much as we can, we still draw from those hard, the hard researches. We are still informed by them. And that's, at the end of the day, what makes it a science still, rather mm-hmm. than just gawa gawa lang. Okay? Mm-hmm. That's why we still need to take an MA. We still need to be supervised by uh, a, a senior psychologist for several years before we practice on our own, mm-hmm. and so on. All right. So in learning to um, assess people behaviorally and learning how to, for example, operationalize behavior in certain um, uh, abstract concepts that we have, like mental health or depression. Um, In dealing with these kinds of people and situations, uh, in dealing with, um, especially since you did mention that psychology can be scientific, Mm -hmm. um, how do we start treating our participants as human beings, especially since, uh, for example, in other sciences, we can experiment on animals, but we're actually dealing with uh, human beings here who are Mm -hmm. uh, the whole, uh, greater than the sum of their parts. So Mm -hmm. how do we deal with human beings ethically in ways that still allow us to advance our knowledge on human behavior and cognition okay so i guess you're you're you want you're really asking about research and, mm-hmm. and research involving human participants mm-hmm. um and i guess i can answer that also along the same lines as how do we actually do therapy because mm-hmm. it's like yeah like are we it's, it's not quite a guarantee of like you will be cured mm-hmm. okay um actually even in psychiatry, that's that's not really a guarantee. Um, um, the medicines you take, we don't know. We don't know if that will work for you. It's actually trial and error. We'll try it for two weeks and then come back, report uh, your side effects, and then fix the dosage, go back after two weeks, check again, and so on. Um, so anything... Um, so here, it is much like there's a lot of overlap between medicine and mm-hmm. psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, and the basic rule really is much like um, medicine, which is do no harm. Okay? So in research and practice with human participants, um, um, th- that the rule really applies. That mm-hmm. at the end of the day, um, um, there should be um, a greater contribution to good, okay? Mm-hmm. E- even uh, as compared to possible risks that may be involved mm-hmm. in whatever it is that is uh, going to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, so if it's research, okay, some, m- most research will involve some risk, mm-hmm. but the good that's supposed to be you know, taken from it must be greater, mm-hmm. okay? Um, in therapy, uh, therapy is not easy, <laughs> and there are some risks. Okay, mm-hmm. like going to therapy. Like sometimes people think, yeah, you know, it's your therapist going to make me feel good. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not always what happens. Sometimes your therapist is going to help you go through some really tough things. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I hear that a lot from my clients. Actually, <laughs> therapy is not easy, mm-hmm. but okay, at the end of the day you're supposed to get something more, something greater mm-hmm. that is actually a good. So that's one. Okay? Mm-hmm. Even if it hurts, it shouldn't harm you. Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we try our best to minimize the risks. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, my so number that, one was the mm-hmm. whole do no, it's do like no do harm. no harm okay? mm-hmm. or do minimize, harm. The risks. minimize the risks. Um, the second one is that um, the biggest uh important thing that's needed in research and in therapy is informed consent Mm -hmm. um the client or whoever it is that's participating within the research has to be informed of um what they're what they're taking part in Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Of course, in some research, there is some need for certain deception, okay? mm-hmm. just, just to uh, really measure the whatever we're trying to measure. Um, but in those particular cases, it has to be that after the, the participants have to be debriefed, mm-hmm. like they have to be told um, mm-hmm. about it after. Mm-hmm. And if there are any negative effects, uh, that they experienced, it is the responsibility of the researchers, the psychologists, to help them through, debrief them, and give them whatever they need. For example, if they got traumatized, they need to be helped through that trauma. Okay. But that's just a very extreme example. Yeah. So in therapy as well, as their consent to take part in the therapy. Okay. So um, bef- before you go to therapy, you kind of sign this thing called an informed consent form, where it's the agreement between you and your therapist and it, it clarifies there what the responsibilities of the therapist are and what the responsibilities of the client are. So it's an agreement okay, mm-hmm. on both sides. And mm-hmm. so that's something that's needed um, to make sure that there's consent. Okay? Mm-hmm. So consent, consent is a big part. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? Okay, measures for the safety of the participants of a research and of course of the client are should always be there. That's why you need to be licensed <laughs> to be a, a therapist. Um, um, you need to be trained to be a therapist mm-hmm. because those are the safety measures. Um, there are also in therapy, there's also confidentiality where at the very beginning, I say, I tell the client, everything we talk about is confidential, except if you are in danger of harm to yourself or in danger of harming others. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning, I tell them that because that's a safety measure. That's a very Mm -hmm. big safety measure that I am putting for their safety. Mm -hmm. And also mine. Yes, Um, yes. So the... The researchers and the psychologists themselves also have to put boundaries on how to, because uh, it's very delicate dealing with uh, other people. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Are there? So, all right. So, that's how we know how to deal safely and effectively with other human participants as we're conducting research in psychology and helping other people in practice. So. Uh, I guess that rounds out our discussion for now on how we've uh, identified the whys, uh, why psychology is very important, how we study it, and how we can um, sort of take care of the people who are involved in advancing our knowledge in psychology. So I guess that starts to wrap up our episode and yay, yay. okay first well, one <laughs> i hope that was helpful okay mm-hmm. um yeah we really just talked about like why just laying the groundwork so for and, everything yes you know, why it might be interesting mm-hmm. yeah so i guess now it's really about do you have a you have questions that maybe you'd like to ask mm-hmm. Um, so you have your ways of sending those questions in yeah. and maybe, um, yeah, Ina and I yeah. can also answer those next time. Yes. And every week we'll be doing that. And next week we'll be going, we'll be, these next few weeks, we'll be going more in depth into different aspects of psychology, like the biopsychological perspective and personality and human development. So everyone's going to stay tuned. Okay. For that. All right. All right. So, okay. Thank you. So that's it for today. Thank you, Ina. Thank you, Mom Pia. Okay.